You are listening to the Your Knee, Your Health podcast. I'm your host, Adam Rosen. I'm a fellowship-trained, board-certified orthopedic surgeon who specializes in knee replacement. Here I'll talk to you about common knee complaints and other orthopedic issues. We'll cover other important health-related topics, all of which are meant to helpfully answer some of your questions and help improve the quality of your life. Thanks for listening, and on with the next episode. Hello and welcome back. I'm Adam Rosen, and you're listening to the Your Knee, Your Health podcast. So in today's episode, I want to talk to you a little bit about osteopathic medicine, or DOs. I'm a DO. I graduated um, osteopathic medical school in the year 2000, um, and I've been practicing now as an orthopedic surgeon for over 15 years. But um, the discussion has been brought up um, a lot recently um, with people talking about it and in the media. So I just wanted to give you my two cents, um, and as well as give you um, a little bit of history of you know what osteopathic medicine is and where it came from. Um, and, you know, what are some of the things and issues that people have seen and things that I've seen personally? So, you know, just to kind of go back, I mean, when I grew up, where I grew up, you know, my primary care doctor was a DO. I didn't think anything of it at the time. It was just he was my doctor. Um, and actually, as I got older and I was looking into going to medical school um, and specifically was looking to become an orthopedic surgeon, he was the one that actually um, recommended my medical school. Um, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, or PCOM, and actually recommended that I talk to one of his classmates um, who he went to medical school with, but who then um, was able to do a fellowship up in Boston, um, and I was able to actually do some rotations with him when I was a medical student. So for me, it was just, that's the way it was. That was my doctor. I didn't really put any designation on the MD versus DO and differences between the two. So you know, historically, if you go back, um, the founder of osteopathic medicine, Andrew Taylor Still, was actually a physician. Um, but this was in 1853. You know, so physicians back then were completely different from medicine as we know it today. You know, back then you, you read your books and you trained as an apprentice, and his father was a physician and he trained with him. Um, so that was 1853. Um, but the Civil War happened, and he went away to the Civil War, and, and after he returned, you know, it was complete grief, I can assume, for him and devastation for his family. There was a spinal meningitis outbreak, and that killed three of his children. His first wife he lost due to complications from childbirth. He remarried, and he had a daughter from the second wife who then died from complications from pneumonia. You know, so you have to assume that here's a man who basically gave his, his life and devoted his time to medicine as advanced as it was at the time, you know, and now lost five members of his family. And that was being a doctor, you know, not being able to help those people. So as a hunter, he was also very interested in anatomy, um, and he, his interest in disease led him to look at the body in a different way. And that's where, you know, a lot of times people will ask me, so, so you're a DO, so you're holistic. And I always tell people, not holistic with an H, but holistic with a WH. And that was the way that he looked at it. He looked at the body as a whole, and he thought that there was some way or ability to correct the anatomy of the body, which may improve function, like blood flow or nerve function, because of changes that have occurred um, with the body. So that's where this kind of term osteopathy was sort of brought out, and it was known as this drugless manipulative medicine, and that term was really coined in 1885. So then people say, well, well, how is that different from chiropractics? And there's a lot of controversy there. So there's a, a Dr. Palmer, um, and there's controversy as to whether or not he came up with the idea of chiropractic medicine on his own, um, or whether or not he actually had visited and trained um, Dr. Still um, at his medical school that he founded in Kirksville. That was in 1892, because it was in 1895 that, that Palmer developed the School of Chiropractics. And, you know, when you talk about the main differences of, you know, so what is the main difference that you could say between an MD and a DO? And there's a lot of philosophical differences Um but the other main specific thing that MDs don't typically get in their training is this thing called osteopathic manipulative medicine, or OMM. Sometimes also referred as OMT, osteopathic manipulative therapy. And there's actually about 40 different types 
of OMM. Um, now, one of those is what's called HVLA. What is that? Well, that is what you know as cracking. You know, a chiropractor cracks your back or cracks your neck, and that's this HVLA. Um, but there's lots of other things that an OMM doctor can then do. You know, some of this is lymphatic drainage and massage, you know, something similar to what you might get from a masseuse. Some of these techniques are muscle energy techniques, which are things that you might experience more in physical therapy. So there's lots of different techniques that people have used and were trained in, um, in osteopathic medical school, which can treat at the skull level. It can treat sinuses and ear problems. Um, in the neck, in the back, it might help with back pain, you know, whether or not it's nerve related or muscle related or joint related, it can help with joints in your elbows, your shoulders. And that's where I think, you know, a lot of people, when you hear positive things from patients, you know, they say, you know, I went and saw this osteopathic doctor, you know, a lot of the primary care doctors actually don't just write a prescription or order a test or send you to a surgeon, you know, they put their hands on their patients and, and they not only examine them, because most doctors put their hands on their patients to examine them, but then they can offer them some additional treatment or therapy at the time of the visit. And, you know, I really believe that that is something that creates a very deep bond between the patient and the doctor. And it's probably one of the main reasons for the positive findings that patients have when they leave the office. Not only do they feel better because they had some initial treatment, um, but they they develop this hands touch sort of change. The changes that you get just from, you know, hugging an old friend. You know, there's there's changes that occur in the body with that contact from human to human. Um, so what is also interesting though, historically, and I gave a lecture a bunch of years ago um, and, and I had looked it up for that lecture. But what's interesting is, you know, I came to California and there weren't that many DOs. And where I grew up, there were tons of DOs. So it, it was, I got a lot more questions. And it turns out that in 1962, um, one of the propositions on the ballot that year, there was only about 40 or so in the state at the time, but they changed anybody that was graduating from the, the medical school as a DO that year. And anybody that had the DO um, degree prior to that was just automatically switched to an MD. So all of a sudden, you had all the DOs that were there that now became MDs. Um, so there was a lot less DOs and a lot more MDs, but they still had osteopathic training um, historically. So currently, we have about 120,000 DOs in the U.S. Um, and, you know, understand that when you go to osteopathic school, you know, it is extremely similar, if not identical in a lot of ways to an MD or what we call allopathic school. So to get in, you know, most students typically still do a biology or science type degree, although, you know, medical schools will allow any degree as long as you hit the criteria and the curriculum. So to do that and get your major, you know, usually most commonly people are taking biology or other science degrees. Um, so you take your degree, you do your MCATs, um, which is your is sort of the equivalent of taking your ACTs or SATs to get into college. Um, and then you do your interviews and you get in. And it's a lot of the same classes, osteopathic versus allopathic, your first two years. They all get gross anatomy, which is the thing people know about as far as, you know, medical school. It's the time where we actually dissect cadavers to really learn about the body. Um, you learn about pharmacology, microbiology, physiology, molecular mechanics, uh, cellular medicine, and then you go through all the classes which deal with all the subspecialties like cardiovascular disease, renal, hemonc, GI, surgery, ENT, orthopedics, general surgery, endocrinology. So OBGYN, you know, family medicine, rural medicine. So you go through all of those same classes. But the one difference is that we also take this extra class in OMM. And it's given you know every quarter or semester. Um, but you know it teaches about the body in a different way, but as a whole way in the sense that, you know, how is this part of the body and this system related to that system? And there's a lot of intricacies there where people can have stomach problems and due to those reflex arcs, you know, have issues in their back, you know, and, and we always can talk about things being referred from one place to the other. I think, you know, people are more familiar, you know, with a problem in your butt cheek or in your back sciatica, but the pain is in your leg. You know, that's a very sort of skimmed down naive sort of explanation of how one part of your body can affect the other. But, you know, rarely do people come in and say, I get pain back here in my buttock where the sciatic nerve is, but they'll describe the pain down the leg. But this can happen in the neck, you know, and people can have nerve problems that can lead to muscle spasms that can then lead to migraines, which can affect your vision and affect your, you know, hearing. And all of those things are all interrelated. So the osteopathic sort of approach is just looking at, you know, 
I'm not a specialist in this one problem and I don't care about the other symptoms because I'm going to deal with this problem, but it's really looking at the body as a whole and seeing if you have a problem in this part of the body, how can that affect the other part of your body? Possibly a totally different organ system, but it can still lead to symptoms. You know, and they also talk about a whole body approach in the sense of, you know, how does your lifetime and your environment also affect your body and your symptoms or your potential diseases. So it's looking at the body as a whole system. It's not necessarily treating it holistically without modern medicine and medications and surgery because they are needed for certain problems and certain diseases. You know, but you know, a simplistic way if we're talking about lifestyle is that if someone has high blood pressure and diabetes, you know, one simple thing would be here's medicines for your diabetes and medicines for your blood pressure. You know, a holistic approach you know, looking at you as a whole person and a whole body saying, but you're not exercising enough and you're not eating well and you're overweight. And if we can increase your exercise and improve your eating and at the same time put you on medicine because you still have these problems, but then change your weight and change your lifestyle and change your eating habits, bring your cholesterol down, bring your blood pressure down, bring your diabetes numbers into better control, you may be able to get off those medicines because we've addressed the whole body. Um, and, and that kind of takes this whole person approach. So, you know, things are not, you know, without concern because, you know, for me personally, um, you know, when I came out to where I was, I was the first DO um, in the training fellowship program. And then I was the first DO surgeon, as far as I know, you know, in my institution. And you know, there's still some animosity, you know, from from MDs, you know, well, how did he get the position? He's just a DO. And and I remember even in Philadelphia, um, you know, we have a lot of orthopedic programs. So it was, uh, you know, University of Pennsylvania, Jefferson Hahnemann was there at the time, Temple. Um, and you know, luckily, I think for the most part, we all got along pretty well, at least the residents that I worked at from other programs, but still there was some animosity. And we used to have this um, really fun, interesting sort of educational um, thing every year called the, uh, I think it was called the Orthopedic Bowl or something along those lines. But essentially it was like Jeopardy, but for orthopedics. Um, and uh, the um, the late John Gregg, who used to be um, the uh, basically the Alex Trebek of, of those things, you know, would come in in his referee shirt and, you know, you had all these questions and you would always pick one resident from each program. And I remember the one year um, when I was there, we had one of our residents was, who was extremely intelligent and, you know, he just always aced, you know, all the, the exams every year and, and he was up and he won. And again, you still heard it. I can't believe we got beat by a bunch of DOs. You know, it's, a, it's the same education. You know, we do the same surgery. We read the same books. Um, but I even see that occasionally where, you know, I have patients that will, you know, come in and say, oh, you know, I, I didn't know you were a DO. I'm, I'm going to make an appointment to see one of your partners. And that's okay. You know, I'll, I'll do my best to briefly describe all the things that I'm talking about here with you today. But I got pretty thick skin and I, you know, more patients that want to come in. Um, so I'm happy to take care of the next person. But, you know, after I explain it to them, I find 99% of the patients once they're educated, they go, oh, okay, I, I didn't realize the difference. Some of them don't even realize, like, oh, you're a DO, but I, I want to see a surgeon. I'm like, I'm a surgeon also. You know, I went to an osteopathic medical school, but did an orthopedic surgical residency and a fellowship. So I'm a surgeon. So sometimes they just don't know. And on the flip side, though, I have a lot of patients that will come and see, see me specifically because I'm the only DO orthopedic surgeon, you know, at my institution. They'll say specifically, I came to see you because you're a DO you know, and, and I have a DO or I saw a DO before and I really like their approach and their philosophy. Um, now what's also interesting though, on the backside is that, um, you know, I, from my partners and, and other colleagues that I know the the one thing that I, I really, um, like to hear and I appreciate though, is that, you know, for some of them, if they haven't been exposed to DOs, maybe they've worked in allopathic programs, they've worked at the MDs, um, the one thing that I've heard over and over and over again, though, is that they'll say, you know, hey, I worked with this DO resident fellow, and they have great hands. They all have really, really good hands, you know, and, and I think that's a good positive thing because, you know, as a surgeon, you want someone that's got great hands. Well, why? Well, I'll tell you the reason why. I think for a lot of the DOs, you know, there's not a huge university setting for many of them. Um, so they work in a multiple smaller hospitals, which is a little chaotic as a resident because you're driving around all the time. But you're also there working individually with a surgeon, and there's not the first and second and third and fourth year resident and the fellow. So you're the person that's working with a surgeon. So you got a lot of hands-on experience from day one. So it's not uncommon at the end of the year to have hundreds and hundreds of surgeries under your belt 
where at certain institutions you may not get involved at that level of the surgery for many, many years down the road. So it's just that whole 10,000 hours. You get more practice in five years, you're just a lot better. You know, the downside though, I think, you know, for a lot of DO programs though, is is just the the book writing, chapter writing, article writing of academics. You know, and that's the one thing I think many programs um, that I'm familiar with in the DO world you know, a lot of the docs are the community docs, um, and and they're working. They're doing very busy practices. There's not a whole lot of docs that are paid a salary to you know be there and educate. So a lot of the education is is resident run, and there's not a whole lot of funding for grant writers and um, article writers and statisticians. So they don't get as much experience um, writing articles. Now that being said, I know some DOs that have written twenty or more articles and book chapters. So if you're interested in that. Um, you know, going to an osteopathic school or your osteopathic, you know, doctor, physician, surgeon, what have you, may have written tons of articles um, and tons of books. But, you know, if you look at the main differences, I think that that ability and access to that level of academics and writing and publishing um, is actually a little bit greater at the MD schools, you know, just because they're geared for that. They have the infrastructure um, and, and they don't have that as much at most of the DO programs that I'm familiar with, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, what I always tell patients is, you know, I'm a doctor first. And I think that probably fits probably with the reason that I went to an osteopathic medical school, or maybe that, that osteopathic training kind of helped mold me into the way that I think about it. And I'll say I'm a surgeon second. So, you know, I probably do spend a lot of time with my patients, even if they need a knee replacement, talking about their knee replacement and the surgery and the details and the rehab and the complications. But I also spend a lot of time in my office talking to patients about their, you know, blood pressure, more commonly diabetes, obesity, smoking habits, you know, just exercise in general, you know, because I know that all of those individually or as a whole affect them, both their knee arthritis and their knee pain, their ability to rehab after surgery, but their overall general well-being, their mental well-being. Um, And if you can only address one thing, you may not be helping the person as much as you can is if you make the attempt to try to address all of those things, you know, and again, I always tell people that, you know, I can't fix everything, you know, but, you know, if we fix this problem and we address this problem and that problem, overall, things are going to start to get better. And then some of those problems may go away and then we can direct more treatment at the the second or third problem that was in line. Um, But I think looking at the person as a whole, again, not holistic with an H, but holistic with a WH is a kind of a great way that I always try to describe um, that sort of mentality or the philosophy behind osteopathic medicine. Um, And what's interesting, because at the end of the day, you know, in the past, at least, you know, many osteopathic doctors, you know, went into family practice, you know, they went back to their, their hometown, and they became the family doc in town. But, you know, now you have osteopathic docs that are, you know, training um, at all of the major institutions, and they're doing surgery, and they're publishing, and they're teaching, and, you know, they're, they're teaching at allopathic programs and allopathic doctors are teaching at osteopathic programs. So there's a huge blend and and mishmash where I think, you know, for the most part, luckily, at least going forward, um, sort of that, that animosity and the discrimination that, you know, many DOs have felt in the past. And you talk to older DOs and they definitely felt it a lot more than the younger DOs. Um, But I think that's going away as, you know, they're more accepted as being um, equals as opposed to in the past where they were um, looked at as being lesser than. So um, I hope that answers um, all the questions that you might have about, you know, a DO, why I'm happy to be a DO, um, what led me to become a DO, and, you know, what some of the similarities and differences are between DO, osteopathic, and MD, allopathic programs are as far as the teaching. Um, And then beyond that, choosing a doctor that just takes care of you, because that's the most important thing at the end of the day, is that you just want to find a doctor that takes good care of you helps answer your questions and helps make you better um, as a whole person and, you know, kind of making sure that they can um, help you help yourself make you better. Because that's what I always tell people that, you know, me and my team can do a lot of stuff, but we can't do everything for you. You know, we can we can give you the resources and make the diagnosis and give you a treatment plan. But at the end of the day, 
it's up to you to go home and do those things. Take the medicine, do the exercise, you know, do the therapy, do the rehab, lose the weight, quit the smoking, you know, and potentially have a surgery and do the post-operative care that you need to have a good outcome. And that's what's going to make you better at the end of the day. Uh, But I think more than anything, the last little take-home message that I'll leave with you um, is that, you know, as a whole person, um, stress, anxiety, depression are things that definitely can affect all of us at any time in our life. And now it is one of those things that is affecting everybody with what we're dealing with, the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. So, you know, if you need help, um, ask for help, talk to friends, talk to family members, talk to your practitioner. Um, Remember, you know, try to eat well, try to sleep well, try to exercise on a regular basis. All of those things have a positive outcome on all those different things. um, But just know that you're not in this alone. Everybody, we're all in the same boat um, and things will improve over time. Um, We're just in the worst of it right now, unfortunately, as of January 2021. Um, But in the meantime, as important as it is, um, really stay safe. Until next time, I'm Adam Rosen. You've been listening to the Your Knee, Your Health podcast. Thanks for listening to the Your Knee, Your Health podcast. If you've not already done so, please subscribe so you'll be notified of future episodes. And if you enjoy what you're hearing, please take the time to leave a review. It helps other people like you find the show. I'm your host, Adam Rosen, and until next time, stay safe.